Welcome to a special episode of Off the Fields where we're honoring Mental Health Awareness Month. We're diving into some raw topics and techniques that we think will help young athletes across the world. I'm your host, Brianna McNary, and I'm joined by my co-host, Cass Clayton, one of the founding members of New Era Prep. She also works with young athletes, high school athletes, and professional athletes from across the world. And we're joined by our special guest, licensed clinical social worker, Rebecca Bratcher. She's South Florida based but she's also a referee, an All-American athlete, an author, and she works with some of the youth here in South Florida, and we're going to be diving into some really, really good topics that we think that can help the youth here in South Florida, but all across the world in general. So we're so glad to have you here today, Rebecca. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Mental health, social work, athletes, it's all areas that I'm super passionate about, especially being a former athlete. Um, So I cannot be ready to say how excited I am to just dive into all of these topics together. That's right. So let's just get started. I'm glad that you can join us today here, Rebecca, because it's really important for athletes to understand that they have people like yourself that they can go to. Even though you're a referee, um, there's so many layers to you that we're going to peel back today, me and Cass. So I'm so happy that you could be here today. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you for having me, ladies. I'm super excited to be here. Mental health is a passionate topic of mine. Um, Being a referee and a former athlete has just only made that flourish for me and be able to combine the two things together to help young athletes and just young adults and students from our counties locally here in South Florida. It's just a huge passion of mine. So thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to have this conversation today. Of course, of course. Let's dig right in. So you're a licensed clinical social worker. I am. And, you know, this is something that you went to school for. You wanted to specialize in sports. And you're also an owner and founder of Growing Roots, right? Yes. Just talk about a little bit how, you know, your passion for mental health started when you were in college and how you started growing roots because that's really instrumental in the athletic community here in South Florida. Absolutely. So growing roots is a huge passion of mine. Um, My original background is in education and athletics, as you know. So my bachelor's, my master's degree, my first one is um, centered around education, actually. And I learned as an educator and as an athlete that I needed to do more. I wasn't serving the population of students to the best of my ability at the capacity as a teacher. Um, I found that these kids in our schools, they need more than just a teacher. And not that our teachers aren't necessary because we need them. But I felt that I served a bigger purpose than to simply be able to teach them mathematics or physical education or health. Um, I noticed that these kids were going through real life issues issues that some adults have never seen in their entire lives and they're dealing with at seven, eight, 10, 15 years old. Um, so right out of college, I realized after teaching a few years that I had to do more. So social work was the route for me. Um, I wanted to be able to combine the two. I never want to get away from athletics ever right. in life because that's my passion. That's my form of self-care and how I keep myself grounded. Right. Um, but I want to be able to help people. So. I combined the two with Growing Roots, um, where I do individual and family therapy for non-athletes, but I center it around athletes and helping athletes to embrace the idea that mental health is here mm-hmm. and that it does not discriminate against anybody, including an athlete, um, and how to deal with that and how to um, not let it impact us to that ability. So I formed Growing Roots in order to really get back to the community and really give back to the school systems, our athletes, our athletic departments in general, um, so that we can get a program into schools one day Mm -hmm. that center around mental health and athletes and how to give them the support and the need, the support that they need and teach them how to ask for that help, how to identify that they even need this help because what they're going through is so normalized that they don't see it. So growing wounds is something that I'm so passionate about because it allows me to be able to be in the community and to help this population of student athletes that I want to help. Isn't it lovely when you can do something that you're passionate about? It's the most important thing. And it's it's really cool perspective coming from you because you're an athlete. So you know the lingo, you know how it is being an athlete, the practice and what it takes. Mm -hmm. And it's so relatable to the athletes that you work with. I think that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. I love going 
even the name, like, how did you come up with the name? Because I was just telling you that. <laughs> I love how you put the Z on the end, you know? Um, how did you come up with the name? Um, listen, I, I learned a long time ago that as we grow older, as we become adults, as we get into our 30s, our 40s, our 50s, a lot of people can stay stuck. And um, it was really important for me to be identifiable. I want to be relatable to to any and everybody, whether an 80 year old athlete walked into my office or a seven year old walked into my office. Right. Um, but because I am centered around children and student athletes, mm -hmm. um, I found the Z to just be something that would help me be a lot more identifiable and relatable to them. You know, right. they got slang, they got their, their use of words, and I just want to let them know that, hey, we might be older, right. but we do know what we're talking about and we still relate to you guys. You know that. And so you're born and raised in Miami, Miami native. Um, right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, you were a three sport athlete yourself. I know we keep talking about how you were an athlete. What sport did you play? Position, school, like? Absolutely. So I I play anything I can get my hands on. Okay. Um, but um, I primarily played basketball, softball, and um, I did the field events and track. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big strong person here. <laughs> um, but basketball is where my heart and soul lies. Um, I was a power forward. And I was a center. I played a little guard every now and then, but they always shoved me back down to the to the big girls down low. Um, but I'm super passionate about basketball. Um, and then in high school, out of high school, I played some NAIA uh, college basketball and uh, college softball, and a little bit of hammer throw in the in the field events. Nice. So much fun. We don't have that down here, so I yeah. got to experience that as a college athlete for the first time, and it was an amazing um, introspective on that. I love to see like women and the shot put events and you know uh Super it's dope. it's really just amazing because you know there's not many of us in that but mm -hmm. women's sports is on the rise so it surely is it right surely is. now when it comes to um your expertise um with cognitive behavioral therapy how does that tie into what you do with the students mm -hmm. um and how do you kind of implement the importance of that because sometimes they may not understand the term but there's other ways that you can you know like communicate it to them so how does that tie in so i um i'm a trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapist it sounds really fancy but um i'm big on human behavior i help athletes and student athletes to understand the power of the brain and our minds and how we can transform the mind and make it a mental mind shift Okay. Um, to help them embrace one their identity and who they are, but to love that identity, to shift it so that no one can mess with that, mm -hmm. right? So that they can grow within their own power and figure out that power. Um, our brains are the most powerful organ in our body, and it can either get the best of us, or we can tell it what we're going to tell it, and it's going to do what we're going to tell it to do. Right. And naturally, in this world, if we're not telling it what to do, it's telling us what to do. And if we're having bad experiences in life, if we're having a bad game, if we've got to go home after a hard practice to a tough home life, mm -hmm. that shift is going to naturally go into a negative way. Right. Just because of the, the state of our world. Right? right. So it's like stress triggers, you know, like circumstantial stressors that may mm -hmm. trigger like uh, raising thoughts or, you know, overthinking, which I think we all naturally do that Absolutely. as humans. But... Like dealing with kids, you know, how do you think they can, like, what's a coping mechanism? You know, what's the... That's a great question, right? Yeah. Coping skills are something we just lack in general as kids. Right. Because right? um, we just want to be tough. We want to teach our kids to, to handle and tolerate things. But we need to teach them to handle and tolerate, tolerate it with coping skills. Mm -hmm. um, so racing thoughts and overthinking is such a common human behavior for anybody. Um, a lot of times we got to implement little skills. So stop and thinking ourselves, is this a helpful way of thinking for me right now? Mm -hmm. Just ask yourself that one question. Is the thought I'm having right now helping me or hurting me? And then answer the question. It's going to lead to more questions. It's going to lead to more thought processes. But what it's not going to do is lead to more negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's going to focus your brain in on that one thought that you're having, mm -hmm. and it's going to stop it from multiplying and creating that rumination, that overthinking. And now you're thinking about your thought in a way more productive way than we were just loosely thinking about it a few minutes ago. Right. Simply asking yourself that question, is this helpful or, or hurtful? If you're having a negative thought, the question, the answer is always going to be it's hurtful. 
Right. Right? Right. Now, if it's not, then explore that with yourself. Why is it helpful? Well, it's growing. It'll help me to grow strong. It's helping me to be resilient in my thought process, right? Mm -hmm. Either way, you're having a much more productive dialogue with yourself than you were by just letting it run and overthink and do what it wants to do. You know, which the explanation you just gave was like ideal. You know, people don't even, most athletes at a young age, they don't even understand how to um, think that deeply sometimes as yet because they may not be as developed cognitively, you know. But at what age do you think they can start to actually recognize things like that, you know, um, as young athletes? Because there's youth sports, you know, and that's what we all have been involved in recently, but at what age do you think um, do they start to kind of question themselves like that? Well, they're always questioning themselves, most likely in a negative way, Mm -hmm. until someone teaches them or shapes them and molds and models for them the appropriate ways to to question themselves and how to redirect that thinking process, kind of how we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, So from the ages of seven to 10, they're probably going to struggle with that, right? And that's why you'll see adults around them, you know, giving them pointers like, hey, it's all right that you didn't have a great game. You didn't suck, though. You you played really well. Your team just lost. And when you model things like that, they start to learn by 10 to 12 to start thinking like that on their own. But it does start with that foundation first because they're not born with it and it develops over time. But if it's not modeled then it's going to be harder for them to, to learn and develop that natural way of thinking right. without assistance from someone else like myself. Right, That's right. It. But if they don't necessarily have you at their, you know, at their expense or, you know, right there, then it's more about like, you know, the, parent. the parents, right? The coaches, because they spend a lot of times with the parents. And I mean, obviously, but with the coaches as well, mm-hmm. when they're at practice, it's, it's mostly them or sometimes they're spending more time with the coaches than the parents, if we're being honest. You know, so I do think it does come directly from them. Do you agree? Yeah. At this age, you'll see a lot of time spent with teachers and coaches. Teachers. And you'll see this kind of model behavior from teachers at times. But depending on what type of school you're in, how fed up that teacher may be, <laughs> right? And you may not get that modeled behavior. You may get frustration back instead. Um, So it kind of hinders the thought process, which is why we see a lot of these issues arise in the first place, because they naturally learn the negative style of thinking before sometimes they learn the positive style of thinking. That's true. Right. Like it's more negative first than positive because we always need the positive reinforcement. Right. Mm -hmm. So that makes total sense. Um, And so I know that you also help with like self-compassion, you know, so it's kind of like giving yourself some grace. Talk a little bit about that. Like how do athletes, you know, how could they really, at a young age, how could they really incorporate that? It's it's tremendously challenging, right? Because as a former athlete, I did not give myself grace as a kid, mm-hmm. even as a young college adult life, you know? Sometimes as a referee, I get on myself about, man, you should have done a better job of that call. Oh, you should have seen calls. that quicker. Um, You shouldn't let that go that far, right? Um, So it's really about honing back for a second and reminding yourself that you're human. We can do that at any age. I made a mistake. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And giving yourself grace is what needs to come first before we can give it to anybody else, right? We have to learn to give that to ourselves. We are our own worst critic. Yes. Right? So it's about being mindful and reminding us that we're humans. And that sometimes we're not going to have the best game of our life or the best practice of our lives. And sometimes we actually might do really poorly in a moment. Mm -hmm. We can bounce back. Right. Or we cannot. But the way that we speak to ourselves and the way we give ourselves self-compassion is the way that we're going to learn to bounce back appropriately and keep it going. That's some good stuff there. Yeah, It's important. We don't do it as athletes. We're, We're more into how do I get better? How do I learn from this mistake, which is an awesome growth mindset. What are some of the stigmas that you're like, that you're very familiar with right now that are like just attached to athletes in general? Some of the stigmas that come with mental health are, you know, if you're an athlete and you want to acknowledge mental health, there's a stigma that comes with it. What are some of those stigmas that, you know, most people are familiar with? Well, 
in in some athletic communities it, it doesn't exist at all mental health right this is it's ignored um it's taken as oh they're just passionate right they're they're not overly aggressive or angry right now they're just upset because they had a bad game or because of this so we normalize it and therefore we forget about it altogether and that kid never learns that yeah it's okay to be upset but the level of anger that I have for this moment may not be appropriate for the moment Mm -hmm. and if that's never dealt with then it just carries forward sports are competitive it brings out adrenaline in us. It right. brings out the ability for emotions to be stronger in us. And so that's awesome when things are going our way, but it's not when things aren't going our way, right? And so kids never learn the ability to speak up and they never learn that it's okay to say, I don't act like that. Like I shouldn't have been that mad. Right. Because they learned then the sore loser concept comes up. Right, which only aids in that behavior happening over and over and over again for them. But we're built to be tough guys as athletes, right? We're built to be strong. We're built to keep moving forward. You're built to fall down and get right back up. Um, We're not built necessarily to have self-compassion or compassion for others. Uh, The concept of sportsmanship is emphasized so much because of how much it lacks, right? Because it naturally goes away for the other person sometimes because you want to beat them, right? So the idea that the stigma around mental health is in athletes is huge, right? They don't want to speak up. They don't even know sometimes that what's happening to me is not as normal as we think it is Mm -hmm. because we've normalized it so much, especially for athletes to be strong and perfect you said something there becky and as you as you're saying that i'm thinking of starting just even from little league from you know pv the amount of pressure the immense amount of pressure that the kids have on them at such a young age how does that affect their emotional or even their mental health like development from such a young age and just going through that whole entire process. Yeah, because they don't want to be perceived as like crying, like crybaby or being weak, you know. Mm-hmm. There, there is still all of what you just said at an early age. Yeah. Tough guy. A tough guy, right? From very early, we talk about some of the biggest sports in our communities here in South Florida being football and basketball. And in football, you start seven U, right? So seven and under, and that's what that means, right? Seven and under. And in basketball, you start in third grade, which is about seven, eight, nine years old, that age as well. Um, And the concept of those being competitive is very different today than it was when I was a kid. Absolutely. Um, It wasn't necessarily about so competition at that point, um, as it was a learning thing, as it was to put your kid in something to have fun and to learn how to play a sport and develop as a player. Um, Now we add in the high pressure of competition and the high pressure of being an athlete and reclassing things like that from such a young age. Um, Kids are losing the concept of we join this sport for fun, right? And if you've ever been to any youth sport at that age, third grade basketball game is the most intense basketball game I've ever wrecked in my life. (laughs) Really? Oh my goodness. And let me tell you what I learned as well about parents is that participation in youth sports from third grade all the way through until they graduate in high school, it disintegrates as they get older. So Mm -hmm. at a third grade basketball game, that gym will have 500 people in it. Parents, aunts, uncles, brothers, cousins, the neighbor, everybody, (laughs) right? But then you bring in the 16 year olds at the rec league basketball game and the whole gym empties out the support has gone. You're so right. And you would think that you're at a University of Florida national championship game for that third grade basketball game. The noise, the intensity, it's so much fun. And when you're looking at it, we watch the kids, they're loving it. It's Mm -hmm. all good until it's good. And then it's all bad when it goes bad. Those, the concept of being able to wrap that up in a pretty bow when you're not the winner of that very big environment right there, Um, it's usually for halfway through the fourth quarter before the team that you can tell is going to lose is on the court breaking down crying the whole game where we're continuing it's okay keep going you're good we've got a few more minutes left in this game right but they've already lost it 
they've all lost it mentally inside and to wrap that back up they're not physically developed enough to know how to do that they don't know emotional management at that point and how to do that and so the way the coach and their parents in those moments respond to how that child is reacting to this really emotional moment for them mm. is severely important at the age of seven right because we you think of a board game you're playing with your kid at that point they'll flip the whole board game over in that moment if they don't know how to handle that same concept here right but now it's much more intense than a board game mm -hmm. we've got 500 people in the stands right watching. we've got cameras everywhere we've got people jumping up and down and screaming when something good happens right and then it all goes downhill the moment that game is over so if that parent comes over and that coach comes over and says stop crying it's just the game that kid is now hindered from expressing emotion. That kid feels like I might get in trouble for expressing emotion, but I can't hold it back. Right. And then if they do get in trouble, the concept of them wanting to show that emotion ever again drastically drops. And you know, I think that what ties into that is, it's like an overlapping thing, the mental toughness, right? That's where we see a lot of people stress that in those moments right there, right? oh, you're supposed to have mental toughness. Mm -hmm. But what about the latter? What about the other side, you know, which is what we're talking about right now? You don't want to hinder the young athlete from being able to express themselves or um, show emotion, right? Because what we see now is that a lot of athletes, if they show any type of emotion, it's like zeroed in on. You know, Absolutely. especially on social media. Um, so we've seen a lot of players vent right after after the games, right after calls, or right after you know conversations with their coaches. We see like this level of venting, and it's like, oh wow, they share that much emotion, and I'm gonna zero in on it. How much social media has shaped the way kids are? I feel like that that also yeah. affects. It's huge. It affects them it's huge, so right? much. Um, so should they be limiting their social social media time? What do you think? Uh, it's a loaded question. <laughs> um, this generation, eight year olds with iPhones. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a huge advocate of limiting social media for children. Okay. Um, it's out there. It's here. It's present. Heck, there are kids in the eighth grade who are making millions of dollars because of how famous they are on social media. So, so we true. can't, we can't oh, avoid that. To, yeah. yeah we can't say, let's just go take it away from them. Right. They're yeah. also, some of them are very addicted to it. So the concept of taking it away would be very dangerous to, um, because they need to know how to cope without that before you just take it away. When you say dangerous, what could possibly happen? Well, the, the idea that they no longer have access to something that was a huge part of the world. Right. Think of the the make the breakdown we might feel if we're about to go to a very important meeting and our car breaks down. It's mm -hmm. the same concept. They don't have the tolerance built up within them to know how to manage the emotion of dealing with not having something that they've had every single day and most likely unlimited access to. <laughs> right, right. And so our brains are hyper focusing on it and it's craving it, almost like a drug. And think about what happens when we don't get that. Everything internally is firing off neurons and your body is sensing danger when danger is not there. Right. And when you're that young and knowing it and you haven't learned full emotional management yet, you get emotional outbursts, you get behavioral changes, you get um, even deeper things, maybe some anxiety and depression that comes along with it because it becomes very serious for these kids for social media in general. It's just a very big outlet for them. Wow, so social media, I mean, um, depression does exist and the younger athletes, like seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, depression can exist. Like they can. Yeah, absolutely. We see more anxiety than we see depression. Okay. Um, and that makes a lot of percent of sense because um, it's a very intense condition, anxiety. So over overthinking. Yeah. Right. Uh, over preparing. Worrying. Worrying. Right. High expectation. Um, we definitely see a lot of characteristics of anxiety in, in young athletes. Can you just elaborate on more on the parent? I feel like it comes more from people that they're with mostly developing anxiety with their kid playing sports in a way. 
is there, have you seen any, you know, examples of how a parent can give their child more anxiety? So I, I would definitely say that the adults and the people around us, it's not only parents, but parents, because that's who they're around most, right? Their right. parents, their coaches, their teachers, their friends, but parents specifically because they, they model after their parents, right? We're looking to them for the guidance. They absolutely can contribute to your children picking up characteristics of um, anxiety. I often have to explain to parents in my office that they it's not um, inherited, right? They didn't get, it's not a genetic thing, but think about it, right? If you're a warrior and you're an overthinker, mm-hmm. you're gonna probably say, hey, Kaz, um, why don't you go out there and practice your shots? You got a big game tomorrow. Go get it. You, got, you didn't get your 100 shots in today. You know, your shot's probably not going to be on if you don't get what you normally get in, right? Yeah. And make sure you wake up and you get that good breakfast in because you got to have all that energy on if you don't get your breakfast in. And then what happens if you overslept a little bit and you didn't get your breakfast? Now you're waking up like, oh, I didn't eat today. Oh, I'm going to stop. i got to stop and get something on the way so that I can eat. And we do this and anxiety is just slowly building, 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 building. building. And we're taking that on. We learn to be based off the people and experiences that we go through from a young age. So it shapes that in kids. And if we don't deal with it and we just keep pushing through, that's where you typically see anxiety in teens. Wow, wow. Now you created something though, like you, it's groundbreaking and it's a therapeutic intervention that you created and it's called Soundcheck. Can you just tell the world just what that is about um, and how you know, parents can implement it in their child's development um, athletically. Yes, I'm so excited about Soundcheck. Um, stigma in mental health is so strong in athletes, but it, it's strong in everywhere. It's strong everywhere. So right. getting teens and athletes specifically to engage in talking about their mental health is a big challenge for people. I feel that I am very good at building rapport with people and that I can talk to anybody and anywhere. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, but you still, when people are going through things and they don't want to talk about it, or let's say they don't think we're bored with people and that I can talk to anybody and anywhere. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, but you still, when people are going through things and they don't want to talk about it, or let's say they don't know how to, right? You've got to be able to engage that person and get them to want to be able to have this kind of discussion at all. So sound check is something that I've incorporated. Um, it's, a, it's a cognitive behavioral therapy technique, a bunch of them put into one, um, where I've incorporated music and technology, two of the biggest, most powerful things for people in general, right. um, but especially for our teens athletes. and our athletes, yeah. right? Always is so huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, to encourage them to, one, show gratitude right to open up and start speaking things so what i do is i use the first five to ten minutes of meeting with them um whether it's in my nurse my initial meeting with them or just every session from there on out um to encourage them to play whatever song it is that they want to play whatever music they want to play for a couple of minutes um and then we're gonna just get them hyped get them in the mood whatever mood that is that they want to be so it's going to get them ready to have this conversation right now and open and then I have them for the next five minutes. Mm-hmm. They have an option of providing a different different types of holistic techniques. So I would really love for them to be able to write or speak because we don't want to keep it up here. We want them to be able to engage them in a dialogue. So like an actual activity, like That's they're actually correct. doing something. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an author and of a line of gratitude journals. So I use gratitude journaling mm-hmm. um, as a very big therapeutic technique to open up pathways in our brain, right? right. Um, to help people see sometimes if it's something as simple as the glass is half full and not half empty, right? But in this therapeutic intervention, I use it to hone in on athletes and it's to get them to talk about mental health in general. So we use it to get them to engage on talking about what's on their mind in that moment if it's their first day. Mm -hmm. But if they're an ongoing athlete in my office, Mm -hmm. there's a specific athletic gratitude prompt Okay. that they can then either voice record over that song, um, almost as if they're making their own song, their own music, um, that they can write, that they can turn into digital art on their technology and use to express their emotions regarding that song oh, wow. and Super. what they're and what they're getting ready to hopefully talk about with me right. in the next 45 to 50 minutes of our dialogue, right? 
Um, so I'm really excited because it's really opened up the ability for teams in my office and athletes to just get in the mood to want to talk. Right. And sometimes they just don't want to. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to say it. And they feel like there's nothing going on for them because they've normalized it. Right. So when we get that music going and they get in their own little vibe and their own little mood and I'm in there with them because I love music of any sort. Yeah. So I'm I'm matching their vibe. I'm matching their energy, whatever that is. And um, it helps to build that rapport and it opens them up and it gets them engaged in a, in a topic of dialogue um, that's only going to ever help them grow. And when they get going, it's really exciting because we, for athletes, I center that dialogue on a mental mind shift, right? So we may talk about a topic like what's what's something that went on today or this week in general that you feel hindered your ability um, in practice, okay. right? So they may talk about a situation at home or they may talk about a bad grade or they may talk about breaking up with a, with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, right? right? That made them not be able to zone in and practice. And then right. we can talk about how that situation in general and how to shift their mindset, right? To be present in the moment and what they're doing. And that's big in gratitude journaling is teaching people how to be present in the moment and having a mindful sound check sounds so cool yeah and really effective yeah, absolutely so i'm working on getting um sound check into schools i'm trying to write up grants right now to get the funding to have it in schools athletic departments so that we can center it around getting athletes to just engage in a topic of mental health in general so it will shift from using the music and each of them having their own individual headphones to be able to have five to ten minutes of talking about their own experience or mental health in general and what they what they believe of that experience as a whole, just to engage in awareness conversation with them. Wow. That was that was my next question because wow, sound check sounds so cool. And I'm sure once they're they are there, they'll love it. Mm-hmm. But getting them there, what what steps do you think? Not just you yourself, but as a community, to encourage kids to seek mental health. Yeah, uh, yeah. without feeling them. judged or the backlash. That's that's the biggest part, right? Is that if if a child feels judged or feels like they're going to be made fun of or like they're not going to be accepted for talking about this topic, they're not going to talk about it. They're not going to do it, right? So our schools, our coaches, our athletic directors, it needs to have a trickling down effect, right? They need to be, athletic directors need to be talking to the coaching staffs as a whole, right? And they need to be having conversations to make them aware that, hey, we're dealing with students who may have issues going on outside of this sport, outside of this school. Right. And the focus, even though you are a coach, cannot only be athletics, yeah. But you have to have, especially in preseason and off season, team building activities, right? Bonding activities for these kids, fundraising activities that can be combined as team building activities, right? So true. And facilitating dialogue, right? Making sure that um, teams like each other. Yeah. How many kids are on a team with each other and they don't like each other? Right. And how do you think it makes them each other feel, right? Like, I don't even want to go do something I love doing because my teammates don't like me. Wow. Or I think they don't like me. Yeah. So it's got to, the dialogue has to be facilitated by the adults to the children. And you have to encourage them to talk to each other because they're most likely going to talk to each other before they talk to us, right? And you have to tell them when your friends do that, be open and accepting, right? Don't make fun of them. Don't tell them that's silly or that's normal. Share stories and encourage them to tell their parents. Encourage them to tell their coaches. They're probably going to tell coaches before they tell their parents. Yeah. But to tell someone in general is what matters. So it's key, right? Mm-hmm. And so it starts up top, obviously, right? Yep. Especially in these athletic programs and, you know, middle schools, high schools, and college as well, right? So, you know, you were talking about teammates, and I know that um, amongst teammates, like you said, some athletes can feel like, you know, oh, I'm not well liked. Um, I'm kind of the one that doesn't get all the attention. Um, And there could even be some bullying in there. You know, we know about locker room talk and how that's like a really intimate setting for athletes these days, no matter what age. And so how can, you know, athletes in general that are part of a team, obviously, 
how can they educate themselves um, when it comes to interacting with each other, you know, and just in their dialogue, what do you think needs to change about that? Because obviously the, with the pressures of social media today, it brings, it makes it like 10 times worse, you know, um, who has more followers? It's all, it's like all the way down to this, those little nitty gritty details. So what do you think um, works for teens? You know, what do they need to work on as far as just that interaction and dialogue amongst each other as teammates? So that's where the activities come into play, right? Okay. That's where the team building activities come into play. That's where spending, you know, some of these kids, they you go to a football practice and it's three hours long, right? They're in the weight room, they're in the film session, and then they're out in the fields, right? And then maybe they're doing cardio after, right? Let's take 10 minutes, maybe before practice, mm -hmm. of doing a small activity, right? Where something as small as everybody has a sheet of paper and you're going to write something nice about your teammate on this piece of paper and you're going to hand it to them and you're going to share it and that's what we're going to do it it teaches our kids to be kind and have compassion right it always goes back to that right how can we have compassion for others if we're not having compassion for ourselves and a lot of these kids are going through so much that within themselves that they're projecting this onto other kids too or they're going through so much at home that it's easy to make fun of your friends and get a laugh in the locker room and overlook the fact that that may have been the worst thing that kid could have heard today. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back to the self-compassion and being kind. Mm -hmm. Kids can be mean if you've I ever heard a locker room talk, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, things that are shared in my office and in my settings with me really takes me back sometimes. And I'm like, wow, I, I can't imagine that any human being would have said that to you. Um, and words, we live by a, a world of phrases, right? Like sticks and stones may break my bones. That is the biggest lie I've ever heard. Yeah. Words cut, they hurt, yeah. they hurt. And you know, if you worked really, really, really hard that day to do your hair in a new hairstyle and you were super proud about it and someone came in and said, oh, that's different. Right. They didn't call it ugly. They didn't say it was weird. They just said, hmm, that's you're different. You're probably gonna be thinking about that the entire All day. All day, right? You might even go in the bathroom and change your hair up and put it right back into that ponytail you had. Um, the smallest of things can impact a kid, can impact an adult. Right. It's important that we're just kind. Be kind, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important for the adults around there to facilitate the similar dialogue, even when you think it doesn't matter, because it matters. And when you, as an adult, when you catch your team talking to each other that way, correct it, model it reframe it for him help them understand why that wasn't okay to say maybe not in a public setting don't ridicule them pull him aside after practice and say hey, i heard what you said to such and such what made you say that right how do you think it made them feel yeah she because, thinks about apologizing yeah because public embarrassment you know some coaches do they do call out you know the players on the spot in front of everybody Somehow, I think they still think that it's an effective way of helping build them mentally, some type of toughness, or I don't know specifically why they do that, but, you know, eventually, if that keeps happening, it affects the player, you know? I think such a situation awareness, too, because if something was to happen, or if a coach was to see that happening, mm -hmm. too, of someone on the team and you want the whole team to know like this is not this is not what's happening right i think it is important for you to express that in front of everybody so you know yeah. like this is not right so it's kind of like situation awareness on certain things that uh, right. certain certain things though should be said like hey Pull this, is, this, this is not you know what i mean so i think it, it goes both both ways that's a really good point too and so like as a, a team, right, mm -hmm. what are some signs that players can look out for, you know, to like check in on their teammate, like something seems off, right? What are some signs that you think teammates or athletes should look out for when it comes to, you know, checking in on their, on their brother? Because it's most of the time a brotherhood or a sisterhood type of absolutely and i think it's big that we do look out for those signs and our people because the idea of them coming forward on their own is not quite there yet right yeah. so 
Um, that's a great question. We want to look at a lot of different things, right? If you're on a team with someone, unless it's in the very beginning of the season, you probably have a good idea of that person, whether you like them or not, right? right. You probably know their personality. So if you start to see changes in personalities, right? Maybe you have a talkative person who's not as talkative. Right? Maybe that person is normally very outgoing and now they're a little withdrawn. Um, you want to look at withdrawing from conversations. You want to look at socializ socialization decreasing. Um, you want to look at changes in behaviors, right? Are they yelling and screaming more? Are they a little more irritable or quicker to get irritable? Less patient. Right. Um, you want to look at changes in, in grades, right? Are grades or school starting to, to change some? Are they leaving from to go home later at night, right? So maybe indicators that things might be going at home. They want to be at practice the very last minute, right? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Um, how is home life, right? So there's some there's some things that put people at higher risk naturally as an athlete, right? You come from an impoverished background, one single parent homes, things like that are natural indicators that this person's at a higher risk for mental health concerns than the every average day person. Um, Not saying that they automatically have it. That's correct. But it just the risk is a little higher for that person, right? Um, because those are real life issues. Right. Um, so we want to look at behaviors a lot in a kid. Are they staying well kept? Is this person is normally a person who likes to come to school looking fly and looking cool, and now all of a sudden they're showing up in their pajamas because that's also a thing too for kids, right? Right. But it's different for them. That's mm -hmm. not how they normally were, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden they are. So you want to look at little things that are drastic changes in behavior, and sometimes they happen slowly, right? So sometimes it's they went from wearing makeup to now they are not wearing their lipstick. But then next week, they're also not doing their hair. But then in the week after, they're going into pajamas, right? Or they're missing a couple of days of school, things like that. So a lot of changes in behaviors um, and decrease in socialization for kids, but school things as well. Right? Isolating. Isolating and not engaging in activities the way they would. And like, oh, I've got to get home for practice early today because mom says I got to be home early. But in reality, that they didn't even have a conversation with their mom. So, leaving. my question is when one does notice behavior changes like that, how would, as a teammate, I approach my my brother and ask? You know, question. because there are a lot of people just say they're good and just continue to go through. That's a great question. For one, you know, if you're a good teammate, um, you'll notice some of these things. Now we're all not always so in tuned with everything, right? Because right. Every a lot of stuff is happening. Well, I got my own stuff going yeah, on. Right absolutely, now. right? And we may just again, I'm good, I'm tired. So you may just leave it alone, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's important to just keep checking. Keep checking, right? Ask your friends, hey, and point things out in a in a safe way, right? And let them know like, hey, if something's going on, if it's okay, you should talk to me about it or talk to somebody about it. Um, but point out the changes. Hey, I noticed you were in class today. Where'd you go? Were you in coach's office? Were you at home? What happened? You know, get them, get them talking. Those are your friends, right? Your friends, people who care about you and who love you, they're they're not going to not be friends with you anymore because of that. They're gonna that might happen if you don't. If you right. don't ask these questions, or if you laugh at their answers when they give you those answers, that might happen. Right. But it's not gonna happen when you're vulnerable. We don't see vulnerability in athletes, right? And if you want someone to be vulnerable with you, you have to be vulnerable with them, mm -hmm. right? So being kind, being compassion, compassionate, and showing people that you care by pointing out what you're noticing. Right. It makes people want to open up. Most people aren't wanting to keep that in. They don't know what to say or how to say it or if it's okay to say it. That's right? a great point. So you got to make them feel comfortable. It is. Um, so just be kind, show compassion, and have the dialogue often. And Bri, I'm so glad that you brought this subject up because I, I don't I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I'm the strong I'm the strong one. Right. You know what I mean? I feel like you two, you're very strong women as well. We don't often check on the strong ones. Right. When we translate it to the field or the court or the high profile, the three, four or five stars or, you know, the really talented ones that we think oh they're fine they're 
they get a lot yeah, of the ones with the most offers or right? you know? exactly right people automatically assume like they are always fine and right. that is not the case mm-hmm. i know you have some some athletes that come into your office that may be a high profile athlete what are some of the things that they go through as being on that pedestal or that high profile that we may not notice from the outside? Yeah, their patterns, you know, are they different compared to us? an athlete who doesn't have the, that same caliber of attention? You know, it's in, that's an interesting question. And you talk about patterns and I tend to notice a pattern. A lot of those athletes are more withdrawn than key to themselves because they have a large responsibility on their shoulders. You know, something we haven't talked about yet that we're gonna definitely dive into is the population of student athletes we're talking about, right? So here in Palm Beach County, um, because I work in both Palm Beach and Broward County, two of the biggest um, school districts, not only in this state, but in our nation. Mm -hmm. And um, we have more than 50% of the schools that we serve in this school are Title I schools. Right. So schools that are receiving um, funding um, because more than 40% of their students qualify as low-income families, right? Okay. So when we're looking at a high-profile athlete, right, that comes with so much more expectation to succeed because they've got to take their whole family with them. Right. Right. Whether they their family's putting that pressure on them or not, that sense of getting my family up out of this situation is very real, right? Mm-hmm. And so some of them are working as student athletes, right? Right. And they're working, they're coming home and taking care of younger siblings, right? Because parents are working or what, it's a one single parent home. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they're going out and practicing early in the morning and practicing late at night just so they could potentially get a scholarship to potentially go to college and then pray one day that they make it big. Professionally. Professionally, correct, right? So that expectation turns into perfectionism. Right? The tough guy mentality kicks in, right? Because we have to push through everything. We don't have time to to deal with everything else that's going on because I gotta keep it moving. I gotta get to work. I've gotta do my best performance, right? I've got a big game coming up or a college scout coming to see me. Yeah. And everything is riding on the line all the time. Right. That's equivalent to survival mode. Right. When people live in survival mode, you're living one perspective only. And that's just to keep going, keep going. How do I get through this moment right now to get to the next moment? I can only imagine the amount of pressure mm-hmm. right on a 16 year old or you know, 17. 17, 17 year old. Absolutely. It's wow. It sometimes is too much pressure and it can be very detrimental. Mm-hmm. These kids don't get to live out their dreams. Life can be cut short for some of them because of that expectation. And it's, it's really sad to see, but the, they're carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders sometimes, mm-hmm. and they don't know what to do with that What do you think about, like, what, you know, some coaches or some sports professionals or broadcasters, whatever the case may be, just people in the sports world in general, will leave fans out of it, you know, because the fans is a whole nother, a whole nother <laughs> ball game. But for those that say, like, oh, this is, it comes with the culture. It comes with the territory. You want to be an athlete. You want to make it to the league. This is what comes with it. What is your response to that? You know, as a licensed clinical social worker, an author, a referee, you see things firsthand. So when you hear that as a, count, as a counter, what is your response most of the time? What do you think? You know, as humans, um, again, I, I specialize in human behavior, right? So right. We're very patterned creatures at the end of the day and that is we work in extremes Mm -hmm. right it is a part of the culture we do have to be tough we do have to be strong you do have to be able to get tackled and physically get back up and start the (laughs) next play right (laughs) so the idea of weakness is 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 gone sometimes because we work in streams everything we do in life needs a balance we can be that person and vulnerable balance Right? We don't have to work in extreme. We don't have to be going 155% throttle, but also not taking care of the other side too. We can be both, right? So we can be tough and we can be vulnerable. We can lose a game and 
push through and be sad and live to fight tomorrow. Mm-hmm. But we can also have 10 minutes where we cry because we sad, we're sad sad that we lost that game. Absolutely. It's okay, right? But how many times have you been told as an athlete, stop crying? There's no crying in baseball, right? right? Yes, there is. Crying is an emotion. We're supposed to feel every single one of them. But, and when we don't allow ourselves to do it, that's why it becomes the extreme because we lose everything emotion-wise that we avoid feeling. We lose the tolerance for when it comes. And guess what? It's going to come. There are going to be things in life that make you cry, good and bad. Mm -hmm. But if you don't allow yourself to feel that emotion, when something really bad happens that would normally cause you to cry, you're going to lose it. You're going to feel it much more intensely than you would have normally because your body loses the tolerance to feel that emotion. Mm -hmm. So the more you're hindered on expressing it, the less you're able to actually better manage it it as it goes on. Mm -hmm. You ever hear someone say, I don't know why I always cry, I'm always crying. Right. Because most likely as a kid, you didn't allow yourself to do that. Wow. So now it's coming out because it's gonna, that's what it does. It builds up inside of us and it comes out. Wow. And it can come out as tears of joy too though, right? But that needs to like, be acknowledged that you can cry tears of joy, not just out of anger or situational yeah. moments or the negative mm-hmm. or, you know, the outcome that you didn't want it. And I think that this ties into, you know, like you were telling us um, about speaking life into your teammates. What would be some examples um, that some athletes need to know, like, you need to speak life into your teammates? You know, I mean, you're cheering yourself on Affirmations. Too. Oh, yeah, affirmations. Affirmations are a great point, right? Um, it's one of the stigmas around therapy, in my opinion, in my experience, right? When um, when people stigmatize therapy, it's because of things like affirmations and meditations and things that we see clichely on TV. And mm-hmm. you think of meditation and you think, oh, um, and things like that, right? <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't have to be all that. It's it can not, be, not right? Like but that, it doesn't right. have to be all that. Um, but affirmations are amazing. They are amazing. I tell people all the time, fake the funk. Right. Because your brain is going to believe it one day. It believes everything you tell it now. That's why you don't want to say the affirmations because you're comfortable on the other side of it. You're comfortable in beating yourself up mm-hmm. because you don't know how to do it without beating yourself up. You got to teach yourself that because we definitely taught ourselves to beat ourselves up over time. Right. right? So affirmations are huge. Every morning, get up, right? Get to that mirror. Say something three times over and over. I am a beautiful woman. I am a strong woman. I am powerful and I am vulnerable. And all of those things are okay. Whatever it is, it's going to be okay. You know? Right. But I'm a big matcher of energy. I think we were talking about that earlier. I love to match energy, right? Mm -hmm. So if as a teammate, right, we're quick to point out, you missed that dunk. (laughs) You got that, right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But Hey, have that same energy when he goes and tops somebody, right? Run on the field the same way you did at school the next day with your video, right? right? Go home and say, oh, did you see what TJ did? Look at this, right? Pump it up. Bring it up. Absolutely. Because we're always pointing out the flaws. We're always pointing out the bad things. And that's also another way that we grow, right? So in sports, we've got to look at film. We've got to look at the stuff that we do wrong to get right. But they also show the stuff that we do right, right? To emphasize this is what it should look like. We got to do the same with our words. We have to. Everything that we bounce out negatively, you got to give three positive responses for your brain to start to believe that. That is great. Coaches need to hear that. Okay. <laughs> like coaches, like listen to that because I think that's golden. That's a golden nugget right there. Mm-hmm. Um, so the ratio, one to three ratio, right? Every negative thing you say have three positive remarkers behind it because your brain is going to hone in on that one negative thing. It's natural in us. It's right. a human instinct, right? You've got to have a lot of people around you speaking in life, not to hone in on that negativity. So give it three, three good ones with it as well. That is awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that some coaches um, also, there's like a sense of denial. I know there's like different stages of acknowledging the importance of mental health as a coach. Um, but I think that one of them to start off with, what we all agreed on was denial, right? So what are some of the signs um, of denial, you know, that you see when it comes to coaches, athletic directors, 
And sometimes the biggest one is like parents. Yeah, just normalizing things, right? Mm -hmm. We're normalizing that, oh, he's just upset, right? Oh, he's just mad because he's lost. He's just mad because his teammates were making fun of him because he missed that dunk, right? We're normalizing these negative emotions in kids and just wiping them under the rug. Mm -hmm. And don't get, negative emotions aren't normal, right? But if we're gonna normalize it, right, we gotta talk about it. Right. We don't talk about it. We just say, oh, that's your passion. You feel that way because of this. We can't tell people how they feel. You don't know that. We don't know that. That part. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I don't know sometimes how I'm feeling, right? So that child probably doesn't know how they're feeling. They just feel it. And so what we see is people not talking about it, not acknowledging it, right? Telling them to suck it up, mm -hmm. telling them to be tough, telling them it's a part of the game. You win some, you lose some. But if that's all we're ever saying, that kid, that child is never getting a chance to really express and explore why they're feeling the way they're feeling, mm -hmm. where it's coming from. Or is it acceptable, right? Is it okay for me to be this upset for this long because of this situation, right? And we have to look at things like that or we're going to find ourselves upset for three weeks about a game we lost. Right. And that can happen, especially no. when you have big games or even – it shouldn't happen. But right. that can't happen. Yeah, because it affects everything. It's not just sports, Right. Yeah. Is they've got to be student athletes. They've got to be in the classroom. They've got to go home and take care of responsibilities. And it's going to trickle into every part of their life. That's where grown roots come in. That's right. <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's right. So I know we touched on this earlier, but um, I think it is a crucial part when it comes to how coaches react and respond, right? Like how detrimental is that, especially during those during the game, during the moment? It's huge. It's huge because coaches are passionate. They're the most passionate person on the court, right? Yeah. Um, and they should be because they're that's they're vocal because they have to be. They're literally teaching their kids in the moment mm -hmm. and also directing a game in the moment, right? Right. But here's the reality, right? Is that coaches are what we would call in that moment the top of the pyramid, right? Absolutely. Um, this is where as a referee, I've been able to get a, gain a really different perspective from an athlete and a coach, which I've been a, all three. Um, and it's an amazing perspective that's only helped me with my work of working with athletes because you see their reaction and everything can be going perfectly fine until maybe we mess up a call, or maybe we missed the call. And then their reaction is very hyped up in that moment. And from that moment on, the reaction and the kids are different on the court. So now we blow a whistle and they're turning around. Right. And so we can't even put the ball in play because they haven't come and grabbed the ball because they're still looking at us like this or they're following you up the court. What did I do? How did that happen? What was that on me? Did this happen? So their reaction is going to follow their coach's reactions, mm -hmm. right? If a coach, if a kid knew that, <clears throat> if I yell at this referee or I yell at another play on this court, coach is going to pull me out of the game. Right. They probably would they'd be less likely to do it. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. And if they did and they got pulled out the game, then the next time it's most likely going to go different. Right. Mm -hmm. But if they're contemplating that and then the coach yells, whether to the player or to a ref or to anybody, that contemplation is going to go differently in their mind as well. They're going to feel a little more acceptable to do that because their coach is doing it. That's the adult. If right. they're going to do it, I can do it. Lead by example. Mm -hmm. They're the leaders. So. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We have a lot more to talk with uh, Rebecca about, you know, mental health awareness in sports.